Hi, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to our first Facebook Live session for the new year, 2021. Dr. Jemsik and myself, um, Candice Willett, pediatric nurse practitioner, are going to talk about um, an interesting topic today, particularly uh, red flags in uh, infancy through adolescence. But to begin, um, on our agenda today will really be to uh, discuss things from uh, the past year answer those briefly, um, then go into questions generated on this new topic, um, and then go through and really talk about our observations um, over the last 20 years um, from the children and families. So I want to welcome everyone today, and uh, this is our first uh, live stream in 2021. 2020 sucked. Um, <laughs> not us. I hope you liked <laughs> us, but I think in general we can all agree it was not a good year. Um, we're going to answer some older questions uh, fairly briefly and, and, um, and then we're going to talk about something that's never been really discussed and formatted and that is, um, and I'll just quote what we've come up with, and it's going to be a lot of information, but it's observational review of signs and symptoms in pre and post adolescence, which may reflect uh, emergence of Lyme borreliosis complex. Something we've observed over 20 years, never, not in the literature, never been published, never really been talked about, but accumulated and integrated into all the providers as we uh, either see adolescence or pre-adolescence in real time, or as we review the history of adults. And, you know, we always go back, and this is part of a thorough review, we go back, to, so we learn uh, that there are, are certain symptoms that are um, have more weight than others, uh, no single symptom is going to be diagnostic or pathognomonic of getting Lyme borreliosis. But if you check enough boxes, um, there's an excellent chance that you're going to be dealing with stealth pathogen disease and chronic inflammation at some point in your life. Uh, this is a sneaky disease. I look at it as an opportunistic infection, quite honestly, where the immune system loses its grip. So it can wobble on for a decade or two. Uh, and then emerge or it can occur in childhood and absolutely destroy a childhood, either pre-adolescent or post-adolescent. Um, so that's going to be the big topic. But first, we're going to start by answering some questions uh, from um, the um, uh, previous year. Now, I do have something to show you. This is um, mm -hmm. Lime Cracker. Uh, this is uh, this beautiful Prussian soldier. Um, was given to me as a gift by Ray and Tricia, and you guys, you patients just bring personal stuff by that's just precious, and we love you for doing that. You don't have to do that, please. <laughs> don't feel like you're obligated. But every little note you send, I read, and you know, it just makes my heart uh, warm, and we appreciate it. Um, I think they gave this to me because uh, my, you know what, gets cracked all the time, <laughs> <laughs> or you know what. <laughs> And, um, no, I think that's the real reason they gave it to me. So I've kept it on my desk for the last couple of weeks. And, um, but this, I, I thought you'd enjoy that. Many other beautiful gifts. And one's on the website, a, a um, canvas done by a young lady in New York, which is gorgeous. Um, also, uh, I, I appreciate your comments about my music. We have one more song to post, which is an original. It's uh, AIDS-based, and it'll be coming out in the next week or two. Um, for, unfortunately, I don't have other music, to, but we can replace some of these. One day I hope to generate another album. It's just time, investment, and money, and, you know, um, life's been chaotic for me and for many of us for a long time. But I'm, I do appreciate you um, enjoying the music. Music is in my heart. Music is very important as an outlet, and uh, those with noise sensitivity, I understand that's a problem, but... Uh, for many of you, you, look to music as a way to help regenerate. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Dr. J. Now to start, we want to go through some past questions uh, that came through, uh, generated from our last Facebook live, and then transition to some new ones um, on our, our topic today that we're discussing. Um, and as always, um, please, if, if we do not get to your question, please send them in. Um, we do look them over. Um, it is important to us and we like sharing information and um, putting it out there so that you can use it accordingly. Now to start the first question 
um, from last year um, is more about uh, what would we suggest for a person who's been treated with uh, doxycycline for approximately three months? Um, they've made about 75% improvement, but yet they've plateaued. Um, so this is kind of a, a complex question. Um, and to start, really, uh, doxycycline for the three months really would be viewed as a monotherapy. Um, at some point, it's going to be no longer effective and really just take on of effect. Realistically, this disease is very complex, so we think about not only Lyme, but also co-infections and the different forms uh, that the bacteria can take on, particularly biofilm, and then there's the cyst formation of the Borrelia uh, burgdorferi. Um, but we have to think about uh, not only anti but also antimicrobials uh, to treat this disease, particularly LBC infection. That means that we would uh, suggest transitioning to a, a pulsed therapy integrating biofilm as well as uh, cisbuster and certainly it is very important to also gather information um, through subjective and objective so a physical exam can also tell us a lot about what's going on in the body and what might be necessary for treatment thank you candy sure um, now dr day there's a couple of questions um i was hoping you could help us answer um the first being what's phantom smells so phantom smells First of all, thank you for that explanation. You know, um, there's an overview of our approach, our step-by-step -step approach on the front page of the web page, I believe, uh, about our yes. concepts which we've had for quite a long time and which have held true. But in terms of phantom smells, that's called phantosmia. Um, and that means you're smelling something that's not there. Um, there's also dysosmia, which is, you know, you're smelling... Um, you know, uh, vinegar, and uh, it's actually um, you know, something quite different. And there's anosmia, uh, can't smell anything. So the olfact goes through the olfactory nerve, which is a complex network, and the nasopharynx goes through the cribriform plate, through the olfactory bulb. So here's a neuroscience or neurophysiology um, little tidbit. Um, the, the olfactory uh, process this doesn't go through the thalamus. So all other senses go through the thalamus, which is sort of the switching station uh, for the brain. And also, phantosmy is obviously you're having corruption of the, of the pathways. And they're going to the, the, to the X and, and the temporal lobe and, and uh, other areas and um, uh, misrepresenting uh, the fact that there's something there. Now, in terms of um, uh, smell, um, it's interesting, I think most of us understand that um, a certain smell, like smelling green grass just cut in the morning, uh, can be a very strong stimulus and a very good stimulus and helps our memory. That's because the olfactory process is tied into the hippocampus, which is our memory. It's also tied into the amygdala, which is our reflex for anger and panic. And it's tied into other subcortical or limbic structures. So, um, phantosmia means that you've had inflammation, corruption of, of critical pathways in the olfactory um, you know, system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, patients have posed have, has really been about weight gain versus weight loss, mm -hmm. um, and what could be responsible for that? Well, I think we've discussed this before. I'm happy to reiterate it because it's so common. It's all about chronic inflammation. A Lyme Borreliosis complex uh, is unique um, in that it causes chronic inflammation without killing people in the short term, usually. Uh, comparable um, entities would be end-stage AIDS or end-stage cancer, but those people die. Uh, and so this is this chronic inflammatory state where the body is on alert and we have ancestral uh, mechanisms to deal with that because uh, your body, your brain thinks you're dying when you're chronically inflamed. Now I know everybody um, eats 1,200 calories, they're gaining weight, and they're you know getting bigger pants or bigger dress sizes. Uh, I lectured on this a couple of years ago in England as a metabolic wedge. I used to call it a fat wedge, which is reported in um, uh, Twist of Lime by Andre Caesar, uh, but I stopped doing that two or three years ago because um, people. Start thinking I said that, and um, especially women. So I, I learned <laughs> that I, okay, I'll be um, politically, I'll be PC here. So <laughs> there's a, 
all so, a little sensitive about our weight. They're a little sensitive, yeah, <laughs> especially um, a little frustrated. Didn't feel good, and sure. somebody just said you're in the fat zone. So I don't do that anymore. So it's a metabolic wedge, and it's um, if you get beyond the metabolic wedge, in other words, if the inflammation is more severe, then you actually get into a catabolic state where you break down your body. You start to really break down your body. Back to the metabolic wedge. We know that lipolysis is not uh, able to be done. You can't break down fat cells. Leptin is not effective. You can become insulin resistant. Uh, there are other mechanisms that preserve fat and build fat because again, uh, your ancestral brain thinks you're dying. But if you go beyond that level of inflammation, you get a, a catabolic state like someone with cancer and you just start to break down glycogen first, then fat and then muscle and uh, you know the ensuing weight loss mm -hmm. yeah Under absolutely yeah. that stage um, and certainly we we have observed that in some of our patients in, in particular um, more rare the catabolic um, and the breakdown um, but concerning nonetheless um, and we we had some questions generated um, more specifically about eosinophilic esophagitis and okay. its correlation to LBC that's a question that's something I recognized many years ago um, and we look for it all the time. So when somebody's going to go to an EGD and they're looking at the esophagus, uh, I say, please have the um, GI doctor do a biopsy, just do blind biopsies, especially in the esophagus, the distal esophagus. Because what we find is that it's infiltrated by eosinophils, not uncommonly. Um, we can talk about the colon another day, but that's in the terminal ileum, but let's just concentrate on that. I'm convinced 90% this is Bartonella. I've gotten people better years ago just with separate. And we use our Bartonella approach, um, maybe not initially. You know, we, we still, we, we don't just jump in there with uh, the Bartonella drugs, which are the rifamycins, which is rifampin and rifabutin, a better drug. Cipro, people are shudder when they hear Cipro. And also Scepter, a lot of people can't take Scepter. But it's Bartonella. And so as we treat the whole complex multiple pathogens and we do it in a priority way, sequentially, we may focus a little harder on um, uh, Bartonella. Now other, another good drug for Bartonella is Cryptolepis, the herb, which is a fascinating herb with lots of alkaloids and uh, even methylene blue, which we've been using fairly frequently the last couple of years. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question uh, generated about LBC is its connection with MCAS and whether or not a patient has to, uh, complete testing that really reveals positive results versus uh, could still be dealing with um, mast cell disorder. Well, I'll just briefly because it's 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 a it's a broad subject it's and it's it's sort of the uh, you know, or symptom complex of the of the day. Uh, we have multiple pro-inflammatory cytokines coming out. Histamine is not our enemy. 80% made in the gut, some made in the brain. Uh, it's not our enemy. Just if it gets out of control, or if the body's out of control, it, it can enjoy it can join the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine march. And the thing about histamine is we can see it. Or we can stroke a patient's skin and see dermatographism, which is a big red line, or they report hives or show me pictures of hives. Um, and we have reasonably effective ways to control histamine because actually, if we do that, uh, we're control. so we're, you know part of our exam is to say ask and say, you know, do you have sneezing? Do you have you know blotching hives, etc. And then examination and the old finger stroke um, seems to be pretty reliable. So we try to block H1, H2, DAO is a um, Stage we all have in our gut, but with leaky gut, which everybody has, it's diminished, so we, we get bad. Uh, Kercetin is part of our natokinase uh, COVID protection package, so that's another antihistamine. And then we may get into mast cell inhibitors, which is monoleucast, and, and including oral chromolone sodium. Mm -hmm. Ketotophen is another antihistamine. So we're pretty, I think, efficient at controlling the histamine. But we do target it, and again, it's the only one we can see. The others are not reliably measured in commercial labs, and um, we can see that, and at least we can knock that out. And mm -hmm. in other ways, we're trying to reduce inflammation in general in all other ways possible. 
Absolutely. So it, in, in summary, Dr. J, we're less concerned with really generating positive results if patients are pursuing LRT testing or whatnot. It's realistically um, something that we treat based right. on symptoms alone. And, fi and clinical and, findings. And clinical findings. Mm -hmm. no. uh, 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 lastly, uh, some patients had uh, some questions about mycoplasma pneumoniae and really uh, how that might relate to LPC infection, which realistically we're seeing as an opportunistic infection. Um, uh, not certain we want to go down this um, well, no, go that. down this road because it can be complex. Maybe I'll just happy very answer briefly. That. I'll happy to answer that. So mycoplasma is a um, unicellular cell wall free organ, just like chlamydia, and th those two are part of our um, Lyme uh, cabal, if you will, the, the stealth antigen you know, parade. The immune system um, doesn't seem to pay as much attention to mycoplasma as it does the other pathogens, but when the immune system is a little stronger, it may recognize it, and um, it certainly is important to chlamydia. may pay uh, uh, Dr. Stratton, who's an eminent uh, infectious disease doctor and microbiologist has written about this. He thinks chlamydia may be a leading uh, etiology for the creation of inflammation in MS. It's certainly, uh, mycoplasma chlamydia is certainly caused by respiratory joint disease, including joint swelling. Uh, they can cause or uh, participate in um, various rashes and all the neurologic symptoms that we are aware of. But the immune system in the whole complex doesn't really recognize mycoplasma early on, but we do treat for it. Sometimes we have to retreat because the immune system, when it gets really strong, will now um, uh, hunt it down and cause a relapse of symptoms and maybe cause migratory joint pain, arthritis in patients that had no arthritis to begin with, or just a little bit. And we call that reconstitution syndrome, immune reconstitution syndrome. Same thing happened in AIDS. So it's about it's a big deal because it's about thirty percent of our patients. So we get patients with neuropsychiatric symptoms and maybe in all sorts of uh, endocrine issues. We get them better, 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 better. We go to maintenance. Now a few months later, now all of a sudden they get joint pain. They got they're aching. They got rashes and um, maybe some neurologic symptoms. And um, so I've been using rifabutin and minocycline on off weeks. It takes about six months of doing that and uh, it's been very effective and those are the there's there's four drugs that really tar target mycoplasma and uh, chlamydia and um, so rifabutin I think is the best minocycline cl uh, clindamycin and zithromax so we have I pick two and we go with that and we use it on off weeks and things are a little rocky for a couple months but by the six month or sometimes up to the eight month uh, patients say oh my arthritis is gone and stays away Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. J. Um, those are some of our questions uh, from the previous year. I'd like to transition to questions from uh, the new year, uh, really generated based on our topic. Um, and to begin, I'm going to go through the questions, and then that way we can we can answer them because um, they seem to all relate to one another. And please feel free, Dr. J, to jump in and um, and answer accordingly too. Um, to start, uh, question number one: How to have a healthy pregnancy? with Lyme diagnosis? Uh, what percent of mothers transfer Lyme uh, to babies in utero? Um, is there anything for prevention of Lyme and co-infections uh, that may manifest after exposure in utero? Um, and realistically, um, if children um, have been exposed in utero, how are we treating? When are we treating? Um, and to start, uh, typically, um, if we have a, a patient who um, becomes pregnant who has had a diagnosis of LBC infection, it really is a coordinated effort both with JSC provider but also with OBGYN. We can't do one without the other. Uh, secondly, um, we also in the coordinator uh, would implement Monday through Friday uh, antibiotics that will be protective uh, for the mother, uh, mitigate uh, or reduce the transmission of Lyme bacteria uh, to the fetus, uh, um, fetus friendly antibiotics, particularly amoxicillin or alternative receptin in combination with Lyme. And we typically do that Monday through Friday. Um, and post birth, there's also something that we would do um, if mothers were interested in breastfeeding too, to protect transmission via uh, breast milk. Uh, secondly, uh, 
our patients who have become pregnant have been interested in doing uh, PCR core blood testing uh, to be able to uh, see if they've transmitted bacteria to a uh, fetus. Of the 200 women that we've followed, 170 have chosen to go forward with the core blood testing, and of those, only four came back positive. Um, so it's very low incident, uh, but we do believe um, that it is very possible that uh, the spirochet bacteria could be transmitted during pregnancy because once it's in, it's in, um, as Dr. J has famously quoted, and I and I recall. Um, and when we go to the, the stage of we know um, a mother may have had the possibility of uh, transmitting bacteria in utero, um, and now we have a, a young child. What's most important is we want to follow them develop as possible during their first year of life into early childhood. Um, and realistically, um, when we think about treatment, it's it's based on assessment, including a physical exam, and really trying to gather as much information as possible from their, their infancy through early childhood. And that really determines whether or not it's necessary to treat or not. Our pediatric patients do phenomenally well with antibiotics. Um, they recover. Um, as you can imagine, their immune system is developing, um, and so uh, we can certainly capitalize on that and utilize the antibiotics to help reduce infection and help them to continue to develop accordingly. Thank you. Um, we, we get great cooperation with OB. We really have, you know, we've had like one issue and that was resolved, and so it's, it's amazing. Um, mothers are panicking about what to do. And, you know, to my knowledge, the kids have been unhealthy, even the PCR positive. I think we sent one or two to Ray Jones in, in past mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. So, I think the spire key goes where it wants to, but the idea is you load down and uh, allow the, uh, the baby to uh, grow and meet, you know, a plan of that sort of thing. overt fetal abnormalities that I'm aware of. Whereas I've had that in... Uh, some women who uh, were unstable, quite ill, but managed to get through pregnancy. Now recognize that, in my view, that there's a study to be done among like 300 we need to do, if we had the money and people were um, What's the instance of miscarriage in our defined population is what's um, acknowledged in the general population? Much higher, much higher. So the instance of miscarriage in our patient population by history, it's not unusual for someone who've had two or three miscarriages or more. And uh, if they manage to get through pregnancy, we've had two or three, if not more, I think more than that actually. Uh, children survive, being the NICU, uh, neonatal intensive care. And it's just a horrible ordeal. And we're going to talk about some of the, um, I think it's time to move on to our main topic today, which is on. Again, we're going to reiterate this. There's such a Fast topic. If you have any, um, we, we know it's not perfect. Uh, nothing should be perfect. Once we out, I mean, several editions and, and constant revision. And if you don't do that, then you might as well um, join the ranks of the um, uh, of the uh, well, I say the um, uh, disillusioned and the not the disillusioned, but the um, uh, deniers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the deniers, you know, when somebody, you know, what happens in academics is, you know, the, lots of politics, is, you know, money and grants, all sorts of things. But if somebody discovers something or think they have a theory, you know, boy, most times they'll not budge off that theory. Other evidence may come out, they won't budge. And, you know, so these academic scientists very way in, you know, so the evolution of science, and this is a little, the evolution of science for 10, 20, 50 years. So Max Planck, who's the famous nuclear physicist who really got into the atom and uh, made um, phenomenal, won the Nobel Prize, lived in the 1850s through, born 1850s through 1930 or 40, has a famous quote some of you may be familiar with. It said, science advances one funeral at a time. Hmm. And so, so, so uh, oh my God. There's so much truth to that. I just wish a manager would chill a little bit. Uh, life's short. Um, enjoy yourself. Give to others. Be happy for you have. And 
praise other people. Better to give than receive. Much better to give than receive. Anyway, one funeral at a time. It's not nice to say somebody, we think somebody should go to a funeral or be in the funeral, or be in the casket. It's not nice. And we're not really saying that, are we? No. no we're not saying that. <laughs> but we're not. I mean, we're not. No. Not really. So, but think about it. I mean, we're stuck. Like like our patients are stuck. I told me the other day, I feel like I'm stuck. Well, I said, darling, you are stuck. But we're going to get you out, and here's a way out. Mm -hmm. They are stuck. And I think the whole Lyme uh, process is stuck, uh, unfortunately. And, and COVID's made it worse. And we'll talk about later. Yeah. But I think that's a nice transition, Dr. Jada, where we want to go with introducing to our, our patients and family out there um, about what we should be recognizing so that we can kind of empower them to think this is maybe a possibility and this is maybe what's going on with my child or my at my adolescent and this is where I should be looking I'm going in the right direction or hopefully giving them information so they can share that with their friends and family so that we can help families as healthy as well, which is ultimate goal especially politically speaking if um, the information isn't out there uh, and yeah, suppressed and, and you and before you Tara Fox have done you know it's such a wonderful thing as a parent obviously you know I empathize with Parent, because I had a very sick child, some of you know, um, extremely sick. I thought I was concerned, I thought I didn't think I could bear it. So um, God was good, and she's a uh, 16 year old and um, usually nice. Uh, <laughs> not always, but she's a teenager. Uh, but uh, it's so gratifying. You know, it's not unusual to have whole families involved. Uh, um, one of the parents, both parents, and one or two or three of you know two or three or four children mm -hmm. and you've been able to get um, children better and sometimes we teach the child first before the mother because especially as a mother because mm -hmm. mother is uh, stressed about her child and that's because she's a mother and um, getting the children better is uh, a, a remarkable gift that you're giving and um, we're fortunate and blessed be able to do those kinds of things um, most of the time. Thank you, Dr. J. Um, it, it, it is a pleasure. Um, I, working with Dr. J, learned from Tara Fox too, and the other providers here at Jump Six Specialty Clinic. It really is a collaborative effort to get our our patients well and their families and keep them healthy too, and for them um, to be advocates for their health. Um, this is a nice transition to what we'd like to introduce today. Is realistically a lot of observation that we've collected over 20 years of experience working with families, um, working with adults, understanding their uh, past medical history when they were teenagers too. So a lot of this is, really has been collaborative. Um, but to start, we really want you to be thinking about um, the beginning um, newborn. So first two months, um, how are they doing? Um, how have they transitioned out of the wound? Um, some of the, the big red flags that we have observed um, has been a failure to thrive uh, to begin with. Um, uh, secondly is, is colic. So that's more, um, you know, the child being uh, fussy um, and difficulty to uh, console could be for a number of reasons. Um, we also see a, a lot of uh, reflux um, or the uh, experience of spitting up pretty frequently and what is caused by could be mom's feeding food that she consumes so then perhaps child has um, some allergy experience or um, is their body just immature. Now having reflux are medications, uh, something like uh, Pepsid or Zantac, um, having to be implemented or different forms of uh, formula uh, going from very basic all the way up to Elementum, um, which is for the most sensitive of guts. Um, and then um, Another important finding is uh, kind of the fever of unknown origin um, that can occur very uh, early on uh, from uh, zero to two or three months, um, which can be very concerning to identify what's actually the etiology of that. And then we kind of want to transition to um, looking at infants and children. So really focused on um, birth to their first year of life, then think about all the way uh, to when they're approaching pre-kindergarten or new garden um, in general. Um, 
Would you like to take on the middle? If you, um, again, I want to emphasize that no, no single system here. I mean, people say, well, you know, lots of kids get colic. So, what's an unusually severe colic, I would say. And again, it's just one check. Doesn't mean that there is um, there's a harbinger for disease. But again, if you check enough muxes, I want to be clear. And we literally have 48 bullet points, some of which are repetitive. For them, um, as we strata, stratify ages of zero to two, I think two to five, six to twelve, and then adolescent twelve to nineteen. Um, so, um, Candy's just talking about the, the infant up to two years of age, and um, they're you know, if the, if the family comes in and the, and the child has unexplained fever, been to the pediatrician umpteen times. That's the box. If they have unusual problems with uh, streptococcal infections or ear infections, um, unusual, well, all kids have that. Well, they, well, I do, but again, you know, that's a box. That's probably in a minor category. Mm -hmm. uh, let me um, retract for just one second. Not, as I said initially, and we're not going to talk about ADHD, but. Um, we do have uh, Jules uh, Capon coming back next month, who's our psychologist and who shared a, a session with me. And we'll speak about that a little bit more, and I can get some more information from Dr. Bransfield, who I mentioned earlier. Um, delay in milestones, that's a pretty easy one. I mean, parents are really keyed in, and, um, you know, how often do you hear, oh, my boys, he's calling, walking, and then he's left, you know, parents are so proud. Well, you know. What if they're not walking at, when they're 18 months or 24 months? Or mm -hmm. uh, what if they have unusual ATP? Now everybody said, "Well, kids get allergies, get hives." And so I'm talking about unusual, and usually severe. Um, that's a minor to moderate box. Um, sleep disturbance, however, is a major box. Um, so it, it was one of our first recognized symptoms. We had a handful that we worked on. It's been expanded ever since. So if there's sleepwalking that goes on, we think that's a limbic disturbance. If there's night terrors, we think that's a limbic disturbance. Sleep talking, um, I would take these seriously. And you know, it's not, but again, it's not diagnostic or pathognomonic, but we put that in our major category. Um, emotional ability beyond the pale. Again, it's a matter of degree. Uh, all kids throw tantrums, okay. I was talking about 24 seven, almost, you know, tantrums and mm -hmm. um, if the child, the, the baby, the, you know, the toddler is saying, my, my leg it hurts mommy, uh, that's a moderate category. Okay, why does it hurt? Yeah. And they'll go to the pediatrician and you see that a lot, don't you? We do. It, it's actually, um, and uh, a symptom of that would be, you know, the child saying they want to be carried or they want to be pushed there in the carriage. Yeah. Uh, most children want to run around. Um, they have tons of energy. They're very active. So, um, unexplicable uh, growing pains, if you will, or discomfort. Um, definitely, definitely a red flag. Just to be thinking about what's going on here. Why don't you finish the, the this section? Uh, sure. Um, next would be thinking about just going to that energy level. Most children have tons of energy, so. If they're fitting the category of wanting to take a nap, wanting to rest, um, not engaging in activity, those are, just as Dr. J said, be thinking about the unusual. Um, it might come from time to time. They didn't sleep all the night before, so maybe they're less active that day. But if a pattern is starting to develop, that's something to pay attention to. Um, uh, another thing uh, to watch is uh, really more of a seizure-like equivalent as a possibility. Some have been tied to fevers. Not all um, are occurring that way, and not all are, are presenting specifically like a seizure. Um, but it's it's something to pay attention to, and it's something to follow, um, and as well to update pediatrician. Um, next would really be thinking about the gut. A lot of uh, young children have gut issues, as I just mentioned up above, with the with the newborns specifically. Thinking about how they tolerate a mom's breast milk. How are they tolerating formula? Then as they transition to solid foods, how are they tolerating those? And thinking about um, what are their, their bowel habits? Um, do they have constipation? Do they have diarrhea? Does it vacillate? Um, is their gut irritated? Is it reacting to um, any foods uh, that's uh, 
that are introduced. So those are some kind of big picture things to be thinking about from newborns to very early childhood. Um, and, and again, want to reiterate that there are a lot of these uh, topics we're touching on can certainly start in uh, early childhood and continue as an adolescent all the way up to a young adult. So it's things to pay attention to. There's, there's patterns, uh, most importantly. Um, and as we transition to the next category, kind of focusing, uh, focusing on school age, kind of 6 to 12. So this is a pre-adolescent, if you will. Um, what tends to present more in, in this particular age group is really a lot of mood um, issues in particular. And um, we won't go into great depth but we have wonderful resources like Jules Capon um, and Dr. Bransfield too. He has a lot of information out there, including a, a book, I believe, let's say that you had mentioned, or, or research articles uh, multiple, uh, multiple. of significant mm -hmm. um, to, to review and consider. He's a, a former uh, president of New Jersey Psychiatric Association. Very knowledgeable, uh, prolific uh, writer, um, speaker, and just, a really good guy, one of my best friends. Um, so I'll continue on from there. But we, <laughs> so this is not my field of expertise. Um, we often work with um, a couple of psych, we, well, we often work with a child psychiatrist, right? Absolutely. But I mean, we have beyond the pale, you know, issues with OCD and some of these youngsters, um, either major depression, why is a seven year old depressed? You know, um, dissociation, they're scared, mommy, I'm seeing you know, things, um, and just, and being anxious, just, you know, just anxious about everything. And that reflects the lower brain, involuntary reptilian uh, firing in a, in a, and overwhelming the cortex that's just developing. Uh, here's a big one. This is a big box. Uh, headaches. Uh, doesn't have to be a migraine. Everybody calls headaches migraine. Most aren't. But um, headaches in boys that are pre-adolescent, that's a big one, okay? Uh, that's a big check, okay? That was one of our original markers, along with the sleepwalking and so forth. Uh, seizures, obviously, if there's some sort of seizure on tick disorder, you know, over a seizure staring spell, that's a big one. This is a big one. Uh, following that, we have dysautonomia, which everyone has, but if you have a youngster whose skin models, who gets sick when they car, you know, ride in the car, who uh, can't stand cold or can't stand heat, um, uh, either one, it could be, can't predict which it would be, um, and they can't do any exercise. They, 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 their heart pounds and, you know, they get flushed and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just talked about motor, well, we talked about seizure equivalents uh, and actual seizures, and then we talk about motor, um, uh, the effect of motor disease on uh, speaking. So they have tics at an early age, uh, they may have tremors at an early age. And I would put this as a major box as well. Uh, again, we have fatigue and middle age. Why is a seven or eight and nine year old, why are they tired? So th this follows through here. They're tired because the battery's dead. And the battery's dead because they're inflamed all the time. And the mitochondria can't fire and make energy through ATP. Uh, eating disorder, maybe you would like to speak about that, sure. Candy. Um, so I, as we transition, um, thinking about uh, behaviors related to food, which can absolutely tie into mood, um, because there are many different forms of eating disorders that, that present in young adolescents, including um, both boys and girls as they transition to young adulthood. Um, some to think about um, anorexia, uh, bulimia, thinking about avoidant and restrictive, so restricting their caloric intake or being very particular about foods they like to consume, ones they don't, um, having abnormal cravings, um, craving sugar, craving salt, um, even other interested um, items like a pica is also a form of an eating disorder too, or maybe even the binge component, they're not eating all day and then they're, they're binging at one particular time. Again, correlated with mood as well too, um, and could also correlate a little bit with OCD um, and uh, a generalized anxiety disorder too. So things to just be thinking about um, and keeping on your radar. Kind of also transitions the abnormal cravings, more uh, limbic agitation there, to thinking about endocrine and what's going on uh, with
associated with the endocrine system. So thinking about thyroid um, and uh, the adrenals, are they playing a part too? Are they functioning appropriately? Are um, they dysfunctional as a result of infection? So some other big red flags. And then we go back into gut uh, this can continue on from early childhood into now uh, pre-adolescent, where we're thinking about the irritable bowel um, or potentially actual inflammatory bowel disease, looking at uh, colitis or potentially Crohn's. Uh, very Occur big categories. Yeah, occurring in the, in the pre-adolescent even. Yep. So this is going to flow down to the, the adolescence, but um, so we'll be repeating ourselves if things flow down, but sometimes the onset is in pre-adolescence, sometimes after puberty. And speaking of puberty, uh, one of the things that we have coming up is uh, precocious puberty and delayed puberty. And so we'll have um, hypervirilism in uh, the boys and um, excessive estrogen effect in the girls. And so they're, you know, menstruating early or you know, uh, starting to develop breast at a very early age. Um, and um, and, yet, and on the other hand, uh, you may have uh, young women in particular that may not have a, a cycle until forever, I mean, never. Um, and obviously there are endocrine problems there. There are also uh, local GYN problems, which we'll get to in just a second. Mm -hmm. But do you think that uh, gastroparesis is uh, you know, more frequently uh, um, present or onset is more frequent in the pre-adolescent or the, in the, the post-adolescent? I think we've seen it more presented in the, the post adolescence, but I, I think they, they're really starting to have more gut issues present early on and then it's progressing and becoming more pervasive. So now now more of a, a motility issue, if you will. Right. Yeah. And there's a, a real reluctance to take a child to a specialist and do a procedure on a six year old, sure. right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, huge reluctance. So, I mean, I guess you get into, the, you know, you start restricting diet down to sometimes almost nothing. Yes, it becomes absolutely. very, very hard on the family. Yeah. And that's, that's usually a, a starting point for most primary care providers. They'll suggest it could be diet related, which realistically, it could absolutely be generated from that too as a contributing factor. But what's the, what's the etiology behind that? What's going on with the gut? Um, is there an imbalance with normal flora? Um, is there infection based? Um, and, and certainly that presents a lot of issues too. If you have stool that's just sitting, um, the body becomes toxic as a result too, and they're not able able to empty. Doesn't help. Correct. That doesn't help. I doesn't said, help. <laughs> Absolutely. All we tell my patients, you you got to get the poop out, and uh, everybody gets that. So yes. <laughs> sometimes I don't care how you do that, but you got to get it out. <laughs> so finishing up on the um, pre adolescent, the school age, if you will, and this is blurred. I think hopefully everybody realizes realizes that there's a real blur here. But um, again, they're going to have sleep disturbances. They can start sleepwalking, you know, when they're uh, in the six to twelve year range. Now that we start to see the, we start to see stria, which are the red marks that can be horizontal, vertical, can occur in atypical places. And people say, well, they're just a growth spurt. No, they're not. And um, in fact, I think they're, I think they're almost uh, always pathogenic or pathologic. Uh, even in people who gain, gain a great deal of weight and don't, don't have overt symptoms. At any rate, if you see those, you say, oh my God, we're in trouble because that stria of really a vasculitis probably done, people say by Bartonella, but it could be the spirochete as well. Uh, and if you see that, then you got issues. Um, and then again, beyond the pill, atopic uh, presentations. You say, well, a lot of kids have allergies, go to the allergist. We're not talking about the moderate to sub moderate allergies. We're talking about severe, almost intractable allergies. Yeah. Now, as we get into the adolescence, um, I'm, we have a lot of repetitive um, issues, but some new. So, if you, uh, Candy, if you want to, sure, start sure. that off. Um, one of those that can start in school age and then transition into adolescence um, could also be more of like an excessive musculoskeletal issues thinking about um, maybe the growing pains that carried on from early childhood, what's going on? Why are they having joint pain? Why are they having muscle aches? Maybe there's a pattern where we're having more fractures or dislocations. Is there a possibility of hypermobility? Um, perhaps even um, EDS picture, so Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Is there a genetic component there too? So family medical history plays a huge part, but we want to start thinking about these things as they're presenting early on. 
Um, we also, as we transition to the adolescence, uh, Dr. J had mentioned um, early or late onset of uh, puberty, um, also transitions to onset of menstrual cycle. Um, for some, uh, we've observed that it, onset of menstrual cycle has been around nine or 10 years old. That's, pre that's pretty young. I have to think back to family medical history too. When did mom or grandmother um, have their, their menses too? But if this is unusual, it's a, it's a red flag. Uh, then as we transition to having a menstrual cycle, typically it should regulate itself within a year, but what's going on during that time period? Is there irregularities? Is there, is there the possibility of ovarian cysts, which has happened um, uh, in a number of our pediatric patients, even the possibility of endometriosis um, and PCOS. Uh, again, uh, familiar components are important here too, but these are kind of unusual things to be presenting in a 12 year old or 13 year old or 14 year old. So things to be thinking about. Um, now in our, our young males, we wanna think about red flags, uh, which could be uh, gynecomastia, so enlargement of breasts. Where's that coming from? Uh, the potential of uh, developmental, uh, development of the, the testes, um, because we wanna think about, again, um, hormonal balance um, and whatnot that also transitions to endocrine disorders that we're thinking of that start in early childhood. Again, back to thyroid, adrenal uh, fatigue as well. So big picture stuff for um, endocrine. Some are already working with an endocrinologist that maybe pediatricians had as coordinated, um, but if not, those are things we should be thinking about too. Um, but a lot of, um, but, but, the, but the pity is that there's a, a tremendous reluctance to mm -hmm. take for the parents to take my child, I'm not saying everyone, of course, but there is a, uh, a uh, I think a, um, a majority of uh, parents who are reluctant to take their child to the doctor, and um, they may they may take it to the primary care, and you know many of those would not check a thyroid test or mm -hmm. uh, recognize any sexual um, disturbances. Um, or adrenal, for sure. I mean, that just doesn't happen. And so to get to the endocrinologist is kind of a um, torturous pathway. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think that while we see these conditions in retrospect sometimes, sometimes in real time, because we certainly check all these things in any age, um, but from on the outside, patients may go, the youngsters may go years before um, somebody realizes that, oh my God, they've got A, B, C, D, E, and F, and mm -hmm. we've got to do something and what's wrong with them. And of course, they usually hit brick walls. Uh, so access to care, uh, to uh, knowledgeable care, I should say. And I'm not criticizing other physicians as, as long as they're trying. I am criticizing physicians who say, nothing's wrong. You know, go somewhere else. We can't help you. I am criticizing you, physicians, uh, because... That's your physician. And you're supposed to be listening and learning. And if you don't know something, the best thing to say is, I don't know, because patients love to hear that. Next best thing to say is, I'll try to find out or get you help. Absolutely. No, that, um, as, as we transition from that, too, we, we want to also think about um, what else could prevent uh, or present itself um, in an inflammatory manner. Um, think about the skin, think about inflammatory acne issues. Um, uh, a lot of teenagers obviously get acne. We're talking about more like the excessive um, having pustules, but leading towards more the cysts, the nodules. Um, so in the direction of our patients been on a uh, uh, year long of minocycline, doxycycline for their acne. Um, well, certainly there's many different uh, topics we could go related to that, but uh, if uh, dermatology is starting to suggest, okay, Accutane might be best, this is clearly an inflammatory condition going on, big, big red flags there to be thinking about. We also want to think about, um, as it relates to skin, um, the A to B presentation. So rashes that are coming and going and just kind of coming out of nowhere, um, or the hives. Patients will often say, you know, just hives all over my body just started, um, and it could be just hopping in, hopping in the bath or going out into the environment and, and a change um, or exposure to an environmental irritant um, in their own home environment too as a possibility considering mold or outside, pollen, trees, cat dander, you name it, different things like that can trigger 
a whole cascade of, of inflammatory response in the body. Um, and we also want to be thinking about, along those lines, eczema as a possibility, also looking at psoriasis too. Again, these are often issues managed in primary care um, and dermatology, but again, can be big picture stuff of what's going on internally in the body and it's presenting itself uh, through the skin. Too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, dermal flushes is what I call them, but you know, typically going back to the reconstitution syndrome, um, and certainly again, I want to reemphasize that no single condition we've talked about um, is not is is um, criteria, even the major ones for saying it's a harbinger for Lyme borreliosis because it may take another decade or two or even longer before it declares itself. But we have fifty year old people saying, you know, I think I've been sick since I was little, and uh, you know they just had to power through it and suffer, and that's their life. And I think Candy, you made the comment that um, uh, they don't know what the normal is. Yeah. You know, the child doesn't have a reference point. They're kind of free-floating out in space. They don't know what it's like to have, what, what normal is. And so, and they've been told not to complain. And there you go. So a lot of things conspire against getting answers. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of things. Um, you know, through the rest of this list, we're sort of repeating ourselves, but it's necessary because, again, sometimes... The onset of these markers or these conditions will not occur until um, um, post-adolescence. So again, we're back to unexplained joint pain, mm -hmm. uh, seizures, um, uh, unexplained musculoskeletal uh, issues, and e EDS, which um, and hypermobility are um, particularly um, targeted by Lyme borreliosis. So they're susceptible tissues, if you will. So in my view, we're going to see more dislocations, um, tendinosis, tendinopathy, uh, things of that sort in patients that are hypermobile. I mean, we're just sort of learning about this and it's a very complex area. Um, but I think the incidence of hypermobility is quite high where the incidence of overt EDS, which has I think five or six categories, uh, and can be looked at genetically is much more difficult. Um, so we just do the handful of uh, hypermobility uh, test to say, oh yeah, you're hypermobile, uh, and those people are at risk, especially you know, including adolescents, and usually mom or dad has the same condition or properties, and um, uh, there's this uh, you know genetically um, transferred. Again, we have headaches. Uh, again, it's more important I think in the pre uh, pre uh, pubertal uh, boy. I think that's really really important. But if you've got a 15 year old that has headaches all the time. Uh, I've spoken before about the types of headaches that we have. If we go to EDS, we're, for the last three or four years, we've understood the uh, condition cervical instability. The most common cause of headache, however, is cervical plexitis, in which uh, the roots coming out just below the uh, bottom of the skull are inflamed. So you have C2, C3, C4, which I can demonstrate easily, and my patients know what I'm talking about. But basically, we're palpating right under the occiput. That's two. The, innervates this, three that innervates this, four innervates this. And if you fire with the second root, the cervical root, it can, it can trigger and loop in with the fifth, uh, the trigeminal nerve here. Now you got a hemifacial headache or the proverbial uh, pain behind the eye sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's the most common, but cervical instability with EDS in kids, you know, needs to be looked at. So if they don't have this, they don't have what we call a third type, a global inflammatory headache which is like my head's going to pop off or somebody's got a vice on my head. That's due to inflammation of the dura mater where the nerve fibers are inside the brain. The brain has no nerve fibers. So if that's inflamed, then they have the, my head's going to swell and pop off or I'm, you know, I feel like I'm in a vice. Uh, that's number three headache. The cervical plexitis, number two. But then cervical instability, and I know you've seen this, uh, Candy, in patients, you, they may have both. Absolutely. They may have both. And we, you know, uh, cervical instability is a lot more difficult to treat than um, the other two, quite honestly, or to manage. Um, but if, if the doctor, if you palpate the neck and it's not bad and the head's not popping off, and then you wonder, okay, are the ligaments and um, tendons inflamed and unstable and hyperlax? Is there hyperlaxity? Mm -hmm. And 
we can evaluate that through a, um, a fluoroscopy called DMX, digital motion x-ray. Um, and there are techniques now, it's actually in the mainstream of medicine, and it's just becoming, it's like a lot of things that we're discovering. It's becoming a lot more frequent. Um, so we talk about roadblocks, and you know, we've done a little bit of that, and I hope you've been able to keep track. I think we've done seven, like we have 18 more to do roadblocks. And um, you know, some of the things we mentioned here today, if they're not resolved, either complicate and foil uh, therapy or preclude therapy. Absolutely. Yeah. And to, to really be thinking about you know that the picture of the inflammatory headaches and, and now the migraines that might be classified too, it's always very difficult in pediatrics but some providers are, are very timid about what to do um, for treatment um, and, and measurements as far as medications and what's, what, what you, are what options you, so for us. When you think somebody has a vascular, you know, they have a migraine mm -hmm. um, issue, mm -hmm. which we rule the other three things out for it. But again, we can have things in combination. Absolutely. And Absolutely. clearly, I think histamine plays a big role in, in migraines. And, and clearly some of these other conditions can trigger, quote, migraines. Absolutely. But actually the migraine may be the cervical plexitis with hemifacial pain. Exactly. And it it's hurts very it, complicated. And it's not a vascular throbbing, pounding, I'm throwing up yep. sort of thing. Um, but that does happen. So how would you treat a um, youngster? Yeah. So it's, it's really important to do just what Dr. J said, go through, ask really thorough questions, go through physical exam. Think about what they've tried in the past. What is... PCP prescribed. Typically, um, children are only really allowed to do NSAIDs like a Tylenol or maybe an ibuprofen. And then as we age, um, we're able to progress to different medications. Um, and we do a we do a trial uh, typically, but um, we're we're a little bit more um, aggressive in the sense where uh, we're open to trialing different medic medications as long as parents are comfortable with that and there's efficacy behind that. Um, but realistically, I think it's about gathering as much information as possible to identify the type of headache and the other variables right. like histamine too, especially. Always. Always. And I just want to reiterate, there is no substitute for a thorough interview and a thorough examination, mm -hmm. which if you're not getting that as a patient, um, you, nobody's learning anything most of the time. So... We're gonna, I want to thank you, Candy, for um, thank you, Dr. Jay. joining me. And um, very important topic. I think it needs to be reviewed once again. I know it's been hard to follow. We actually have a very nice little, neat little okay. summary of this. Again, this is first time ever stuff. It's not published. It's our experience over 20 years. It's uh, our intellectual property, which I want to share with you. We'll put on site, but I think we need to do a video and, and discuss it. Uh, a little further and more detail and to make the video better we'd welcome your input and questions and suggestions mm -hmm. and I'm sure I am 100% sure of the things we there are things we missed that are valid so please uh, send us your thoughts um, and uh, we very much appreciate that and it's always an honor uh, to be with you and uh, we'll, we're going to do the video in the next week or two and Jules Capon is going to be back with me uh, following up on some of this and some of the psychosocial issues, general information and questions, which I'll handle mostly. And she's going to be back with us um, in about a month and we'll have a date for you real soon. Take care. God bless.